Tonight's psalm reading will be Psalm 103. That'll be page 939 in your pew Bibles. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like the grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Blessed be the word of the Lord. I think in the bulletin I put down <clears throat> verses 11 and 12 for our call to worship, but I think that verses 8 through 10 are going to fit what God has called us to hear tonight a little bit better. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. With that in mind, people of God, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship him. Well, Psalm 103 is a familiar one. It's one, that's, it's one that's fun to sing. Let's stand with the music here and we'll sing four verses of it.
greets us here this evening. We do that by being reminded of what it is that we confess from his word. We're up to article number 23 this week. Let's confess together. We believe that our blessedness lies in the forgiveness of our sins because of Jesus Christ, and that in it our righteousness before God is contained. As David and Paul teach us, when they declare that man blessed to whom God grants righteousness apart from works. And therefore we cling to this foundation, which is firm forever, giving all glory to God, humbling ourselves and recognizing ourselves as we are, not claiming a thing for ourselves or our merits, and leaning and resting on the sole obedience of Christ crucified, which is ours when we believe in him. That is enough to cover all our sin and to make us confident, freeing from the conscience, from the fear, dread, and terror of God's approach without doing what our first father Adam did, who trembled as he tried to cover himself with fig leaves. In fact, if he had to appear before God, relying no matter how little on ourselves or some other creature, then alas, we would be swallowed up. Therefore, everyone must say with David, Lord, do not enter into judgment with your servants, for before you, no living person shall be justified. Of course, David was speaking of people who are apart from Christ. They will not be justified. You are not apart from Christ. You're in Christ. And because of that, God smiles upon you here tonight as you come into his house. He says to you, grace and mercy and peace are yours. From God, your father, from Jesus Christ, his son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. As we turn to prayer tonight, one item to begin us with, we prayed for this last week as well, and then I forgot to mention it this morning, but that is that Ani will be leaving, I think it's tomorrow, the 22nd, is that tomorrow? Yeah, the 22nd for Liberia, and she's going to be there for a month. Uh, and so that'll be a big day of travel for her tomorrow. We want to keep her in prayer and pray that everything goes well, <laughs> that the blue screen of death doesn't come back to the airports and knock out all the computers like it did just a few days ago. Uh, so hopefully things go well for, for Ani and she's able to have a good trip back home. Uh, so we'll be in prayer for her. Other items uh, of prayer or praise tonight. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an awkward s s spot, isn't it? We, we, you love to have this time with her, but yet you're, you're so looking forward to, to her being home too. And yeah, yeah. It would, yeah, it sure would. So we'll pray for that. Uh, we'll be, um, uh, like, like we learned this morning, we pray with thanksgiving, right? So, so we, we're, we're grateful that she's got this alertness now that she didn't have just a while ago and pray that that continues uh, through her birthday. But then also uh, she is ready to go home to her Lord. And so we'll, we'll pray that that day comes to, uh, for her benefit, yeah. Yeah. Great grandchild number 12 for, for Nelma. Yeah. 
Scott, we'll pray for your sister's family too. You had mentioned, was it last week, that that was a year ago that, that your niece was killed in that accident. And so we'll remind me of their names again. They're in Nebraska, right? Yeah, yeah, you remember that about a year ago, uh, uh, 12 years old, I think Alexis was uh, killed in an ATV accident. And so sometimes when these anniversaries come around, that, that reopens all of those wounds again. So we'll pray for Lori and her family. Other items for prayer or praise tonight. Now, of course, our prayers will be with the Wegg family as well, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have invited us into your house here tonight to bless your name, to praise your name above all things. We thank you for your compassion that you have shown to us. Uh, we'll talk about that later on as we move on here tonight, uh, the, the tremendous forgiveness that you have shown us through your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, what a blessing that is, Father. What a blessing that is to cling to as we walk through the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death here with the Wegg family, Father, we thank you so much for the life of Anita, for all of the impact that she had uh, on Christian education and the things that she did here in this church and in the Bigelow Christian Reformed Church. We thank you for her life, for her uh, family that she has left behind, uh, all good, solid followers of you. We thank you so much for her. We thank you also for calling her home out of her misery and sickness that she was dealing with, uh, uh, that she dealt with uh, so well and so patiently, Father. Uh, and so we thank you that she's home with you now, that she's around that sea of crystal, praising your name. What a tremendous comfort that is to us. Father, we also thank you for the life of Gert Vanderkoy. We thank you that she is able to have a little bit more alertness now and, and uh, have conversation with her children and those that she loves that are close to her. We thank you for bringing her to such a tremendous age of 100 years old. Uh, we do pray that she's able to make it uh, to her birthday on Thursday. Uh, but Father, she is ready to come home to you as well. Uh, she looks forward to that, to being set free uh, from uh, this life and, and being welcomed into your loving arms because of Jesus Christ, her Savior. So, uh, Father, we know that she is in your hands. She has always been, uh, as we all are. And so we thank you for the confidence that that gives to us. Father, we also want to lift up uh, Scott's sister, Lori, and her family as, once again, uh, the, re the reminders and the memories of such a terrible and tragic day a year ago that happened when their daughter, Alexa, was suddenly killed, uh, all come rushing back in on the anniversary of it. Uh, Father, be near to that family, be near to Scott and to his family as they miss somebody that they loved uh, very much as well. Uh, and we pray that th your peace would be upon this family and during this time of tragic loss, uh, at least when they remember it a year on, uh, Father, sometimes the wounds are even worse a year later. And so we do pray for Lori that you would strengthen and sustain her. Father, uh, we pray that you're with Ani as she sets off on a remarkable trip halfway across the world, really all the way across the world, uh, to the other side, uh, to Liberia, Father. We pray that all of the things that need to fall into place for her will as she travels through different airports across this country and then across the ocean. Uh, we pray for safety for her. We pray for a good time visiting her mother. And uh, we thank you that she can be there for a month and have a good visit with her and uh, be near to Ani as she takes this trip. Uh, and Father, we pray that everything goes well for her in that. Father, we thank you for your blessings in our lives. Uh, we thank you that it's made known to us in so many different ways, so many things that we just take for granted all the time. Uh, but these are good blessings and gifts from you, Father. We thank you for them. We thank you for calling us here into your house to begin our new week here in this place with you, being reminded of what it is that you have done for us. So as we turn to your word once again tonight, we pray for your blessing to be on that as well. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we turn to God's word tonight, we're going to be singing a song of preparation, God of the Word. 
Uh, this is a song that sort of shifts gears about halfway through, but it's a song that goes by quickly. It talks about the babble of the world to begin with, uh, and then how it is that you and I stand firmly on God's word in the midst of this chaos. So remember, the song is going to go by quickly, so you got to be engaged with it right off the bat. Stand with the music, and let's sing the one verse of God of the Word. You may be seated and open your Bibles up to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 57. I think if this is the only thing that you knew about what the Belgic Confession was about, we've been going through the Belgic Confession this year, uh, that it teaches, and these are exact words from it that you see in the title there, it's an exact quotation, that God's grace brings us freedom from the fear and dread and terror of God's approach. If this is the only thing you knew about what this document proclaims, that ought to grab your interest, that ought to percolate within you. And, and uh, to understand that here tonight, we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57. Here, this is uh, something that we read together this past week. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to see both God speaking to us directly here through Isaiah, and then the final verse there, verse 21, is going to be commentary, really, that, that Isaiah adds back in, puts, uh, we'll see how that works itself out there in verse 21, but, but we're going to begin here with God speaking to us. Uh, Isaiah chapter 57, we're going to begin reading at verse 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse forever, nor, nor will I all, always be angry, for then the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created. I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him, and I hid my face in anger. Yet he kept on in his willful ways. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked, the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. Now you see that the the, the tense shifts a little bit. This is Isaiah reporting again what God has said after quoting directly from him. There is no peace, says my God, Isaiah writing there. There is no peace for the wicked. Let's thank God for his gospel here tonight, which is presented to us in the Old Testament. Father, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you that you live with us as we heard here in your word from Isaiah 57. Be with us here now tonight as we dig into this and we look at the theology that underlies it. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
So yeah, we're going to spend a few, a few moments here going through Isaiah 57, and then yeah, we're going to shift and look at what it is that's being said to us, not only in Isaiah 57, but as we look at it in the context of all of God's word put together. Look at the contrast here that this passage begins with. We are introduced here to this one who is high and exalted, who lives forever, whose name is holy. None of those are attributes that apply to us here, right? We are all the opposite of those things. We are, uh, we've lowered ourselves from God's high expectations. We are no longer exalted, lifted up is what that means. Uh, we li- try and lift ourselves up. We try and exalt ourselves, but that adds up to nothing. We are not ones who live forever. We're mortal, and our name is certainly not holy. Holy here is used in the context of being set apart and different from the rest of creation. But this is who our God is. This one who lives in a high and holy place. Now here's where we get the contrast. But yet he also lives with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. Right? Every time we look at one aspect of our God, there's always going to be a countervening aspect of it that we need to understand to hold it in tension. All of our theology is in tension. God lives in a high and holy place, but he does so with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. This ought to give us tremendous hope. Uh, sometimes we can put God, it's, it's good to put God on the highest pedestal we can to exalt him and lift him up. Uh, but then sometimes that's done in such a way that puts him so far out of reach uh, that the common man can have no relationship with him. That's not the case here as God speaks to us. Yes, he is in a high and holy place, cannot be any higher, cannot be any more holy than what God is. But yet at the same time, he lives with the one who is contrite. And lowly in spirit. He lives to revive the spirit of the lowly. And to revive, to give new life to the heart of the contrite. That says, I will not accuse him forever, nor will I always be angry. Look at how our God knows us here. Right? He knows that, and we saw this in Psalm 103 too, right? That he remembers that we are dust. That we can only endure so much that we would faint away because of his anger if he were to accuse us forever, which is what we deserve. The very people that I have created, his handiwork, he wants to be in relationship with you. It's what he created you for. Of course he's angry with our sinful greed and he punishes us and he hides his face from us in anger. He does that out of his love the same way that you do it out of your love when you punish your children because you don't want them to get hurt and they would get hurt if they kept on doing something wrong. You pull them back from it and sometimes you have to do that forcefully in a way that they don't like. That's what God would do when he disciplines us. But yet, they kept on in their willful ways. Isn't that an excellent description of who and what humanity is? God says, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will heal him. This is the gospel. This is the gospel presented to Isaiah a thousand years before Jesus would even be on earth. I will guide him and restore him, to restore comfort to Israel's mourners. I didn't highlight that last phrase there, that I will restore comfort. But really, that's, as as I looked through these Uh, points that we're going to be going through tonight. That's what this is all about. We're going to see that really big here in just a moment, that what God is doing is restoring comfort to those who are mourning their sin, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace, God says to those far and near, and I will heal him. But the wicked, God said, the wicked are like the tossing sea. Now remember, whenever we see references to the sea in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament here, the Israelites were not seafaring people. The sea is chaos. The sea is everything out of order. That's what life is like for the wicked. The wicked cannot rest. There's no comfort for the wicked. And this isn't shocking for us 
to read this, isn't this? This makes sense. This is a description of what life is like for so many people. There's no rest for them ever. They're always trying to grab onto something that they can't grab onto, to the hevel of life, right? That's how Ecclesiastes explains it, that, that smoke that, that is meaningless, that, you, that looks so real and looks like it's going to give you rest, and you grab onto it, and it's just nothing. It's just the sea, it's chaos. That's where the wicked are. But it's this last line that, that didn't jump out uh, at me until I looked at it again this afternoon. There is no peace, says my God for the wicked. There's no shalom, right? Shalom is that Jewish word that's translated, or your Hebrew word that's translated here into peace. Shalom is that state in which everything is the way that it's supposed to be, right? To where physically you have what you need, mentally and spiritually you have what you need, and above and beyond that, you're back in a good relationship with God. If any one of those things is mi missing, mentally, physically, or spiritually, then shalom is, is gone. It's, 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 things are not the way that they're supposed to be. That's what's being talked about here by our God in Isaiah 57. This was translated so many different ways, uh, which is always a fascinating thing to me. This is from the Net Bible. There will be no prosperity says my God for the wicked. I think that's a really, really good way to translate the word shalom. It's prosperity. It's living the way things are supposed to be. And God says they'll never be living the way that things are supposed to be as long as you're standing apart from me. But it gets even more interesting when we look at what we call the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And the reason that it's so important is by the time that we get to the time of Jesus, around the first century, people were not very schooled in Hebrew anymore. Remember the Roman Empire is in charge and the Roman Empire consolidates things. And one of the biggest ways that they did that is by making a common language that everybody would speak. And so Paul and the other apostles would have read the Hebrew scriptures in Greek. And here's how Paul would have re read this. Uk estin karin, epin hatheos tois asabasin. Now that doesn't mean anything to you, but here's what it meant to Paul. There is no rejoicing. And I think the reason that that stuck out to me this afternoon as I read that is because of what we read this morning, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. This is what it means to rejoice in the Lord always, is to live with shalom, to live with things the way they're supposed to be. That's why we talked about that this morning, that rejoicing isn't an emotion. It's not something that we feel. It's an attitude. It's a condition that we live in. It's having shalom with God. This is the way we are to live, rejoicing. And there's no rejoicing, says God, among the ungodly. All of that to say this. Here's how our confession begins this article. The key to your blessedness. Now, I don't know what kind of image in your mind that word blessedness evokes. But I think if I were to describe to you the image that comes into my mind when I think of the word blessedness is one of these old paintings from the Middle Ages or whatever where you see a cloud and then there's like this little cherubim style baby with wings on its back type of angel with a halo around its head strumming a harp. That's just the, the connotation that I have for this word blessedness. And quite frankly, that doesn't look very appealing to me. Why would I want blessedness if that's what it's all about? But that's not at all what this word blessedness is all about. It's really living with this shalom that we long for so much. It's about having everything be the way that it's supposed to be in our lives. That's why we see it come up at such critical parts of Scripture. The first psalm is the psalm that sets the tone for 
all of the rest of the Psalms that follow us. And the very first word in this first Psalm is blessed with shalom, prosperous, happy is the man who's living the way that God created him to live by not walking in the counsel of the wicked or standing in the way of sinners or sitting in the seat of scoffers. This is also one of the first words that Jesus used as he began his ministry here in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed, happy, fulfilled, living the way that they're designed are those who are poor in spirit. And of course, the list goes on. But this is what it means to live revived by our God, as we saw there in Isaiah 57. So the key to this blessedness, really, the key to happiness, the key to prosperity, the key to living the way that God has designed you to live, are these things as we see them in our confession. First of all, the key to your blessedness is in the forgiveness of sins for Jesus' sake. Right? If we're not starting here, we're never going to find the blessedness that we desire. We have to start with Christ. Right? That's what John reminds us here. He writes his letter to us so that we will not sin, but then he reminds us right off the bat, if you do sin, and you will, you have an advocate. You have somebody on your side with the Father, and of course that's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is that mercy seat that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world, meaning that everybody across the world who would believe in Christ would have their sins paid, uh, atoned for. So the key to living this blessed life is knowing that your sins are forgiven. And we're gonna find out why that's so important, that you know that your sins are forgiven. It's, it's good that your sins are forgiven, but if you don't know it, if th- then you're not going to be able to, to enjoy the benefits of it. Right? We want to both know it and have it be true and have the benefits that come from it. And, and the reason that this is the key to our blessedness, our prosperity, our shalom, is because this forgiveness that we get from Christ is what makes us right with God. Now remember Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not live the way that the world lives, but verse 2 goes on, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, right? That's how we live a happy and blessed life. It's very interesting then how David puts it here in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Right, Because we've all taken those detours that we're told not to take in Psalm 1 uh, where we spent time with the wicked and just got more and more ensconced in that sin. And David says, even if you've taken those wrong routes, your sins are forgiven. And you still have the ability to live in this blessedness that you were created to live in. So it comes in your forgiveness of sins for Jesus' sake because that's what makes you right with God because God grants you Christ's righteousness. We talk about this almost every week this summer, right? As we've been going through how it is that we're saved. This righteousness is what we need more than anything else and it's granted to us by Christ apart from our works. This was the, uh, or the, yeah, there's the second point there, that our justification Our justification comes freely by grace. We're made just as if we had never sinned and just as if we had always obeyed. That's what we talked about last week. Here was our passage from last week. All are justified freely by his grace, which comes through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, here's where it all wraps up. Let's go back to Romans 3 there. We're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Okay, at this point, this is all good and interesting. Uh, These theological tidbits that we can put in our brain and, and maybe win at a contest of Bible trivia at some point in time. But really, what good does it know or what good does it do to know any of this? Well, here's what good it does to know it. Because since you've been justified through faith, you have peace with God. Right, this word, 
that just seems to hold everything together in the Bible that we looked at all the way back in Isaiah 57. The wicked will never have peace with God. Things will never be the way that they're supposed to be with God. They'll never have shalom and that's going to just tank their entire life. You, on the other hand, in Christ, have peace with God. You understand what this means for you? This means that shalom for you is attainable here and now. Now, it will never be the shalom that Anita is enjoying right now in the presence of Christ. It will never be that great. But yet we can have these episodes of shalom here and now in this world. There is life to enjoy here and now in this world because we have peace with God. We have the one component of shalom that would never be able to be attainable on our own because you can get prosperity physically, can't you? You can have the nicest house, the most comfortable car, and the most beautiful clothes, everything physically that a person can have. Anybody can go out and get that. You could have shalom physically in your health, not have any sickness or disease or anything that's degenerative in your body. You're just as healthy as a horse. So you've got those two big components of shalom going for you. And anybody can get this, not just Christians. They can have this physical shalom. They can have uh, shalom in their health and, and even in their mental faculties, just have everything be the way that they're supposed to be. But the one component they can never have that the wicked can never have is this final and very necessary component for it to be real shalom. They cannot have peace with God. They will never be happy. This is what the gospel is all about, isn't it? That sounds so trite. And it sounds so shallow to say that this is about your happiness. And it is trite and shallow when we think of happiness from a worldly standpoint, just having stuff and feeling good. No, we're talking about happiness from a biblical standpoint, blessedness, shalom, living the way that we've been designed to live as image bearers of a God who lives in a high and holy place. We can have that here and now because we have peace with God. Now that also works in reverse. Right? It's very, very hard, and it's very, very transitory to have full shalom here in this world. It's not very often, even in the life of Christians, that you get all of those components working together. Let's just use Anita for an example. Godly woman, wasn't she? She had peace with God. She had that component fully covered. But physically, especially these last few years, she didn't have shalom. Right? She... She was sick, and, and her body was, was, she couldn't walk. She was in South Shore, and that's a miserable place to be. Uh, and things weren't right, so she wasn't fully at peace. She wasn't fully having shalom here in this life. Right? But she had peace with God, and that made all the difference for her. So out of all of the different components that it takes to have shalom, this is the most important. And this is the one that you can have with Christ that can never be taken away. Your stuff can be taken away. Your health can be taken away. Every other thing that counts towards shalom can be taken away from you, but not this. You have peace with God. And the day will come when either Christ returns to us or we're brought home to him where that full shalom will be restored once again. That's what we look forward to as Christians. We look forward to the blessedness of life with Christ. It comes through the forgiveness of our sins because that forgiveness makes us right with God and gives us peace with him. Now, how do we enjoy this blessedness? Again, because of the prosperity gospel, uh, we kind of like to shy away from this kind of thing uh, as we talk about it, as if there's something wrong with talking about enjoyment of life uh, here in a Christian church. There's not. This life was given to us to be enjoyed, to enjoy the blessedness that God has created us to have. How do we do that? Well, our confession helps us. Number one, we do that by giving all of the glory to God. You'll see this Latin phrase so often around Reformed churches, right? Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. 
Well, we're told to give the glory of God. I love Psalm 115 here. Here's how it begins. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Ezekiel, this is a great passage here. It's kind of long, uh, but this is just fantastic. This is God speaking, or he's given instructions to, to Ezekiel to say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. Do you see what God is saying to us here. So often we, we thank God for giving us this salvation, for doing this thing for us. And it's good and proper to give thanks to God for that. That's not what I'm saying. But in a sense, God is looking back and saying, I, I didn't do it for you. I didn't save you for you. I saved you for my name. Because my name is high and holy and it will not be profaned. You have profaned it. I needed to pick you up out of it because you were profaning my name. Not because I wanted you to be happy, but because you were profaning my name and that will not stand. So I picked you up. I took your sins. I paid for them myself through my son. uh, And now I have restored you, revived you, and brought you back to life again. But I did it for the sake of my name. Right? So this is, we're reminded of this because then what's our obligation now? It's not to live in shalom so that we can enjoy happiness for ourselves. No, it's so that we can live in shalom and give the glory to God. That's where it, be, that's where it belongs. So, to enjoy blessedness, we live a life of soli deo gloria, giving glory to God, all of the glory to God alone. Secondly, we're to humble ourselves before God. Humble ourselves before God. Peter tells us this. We're going to look at this verse and the verses that follow it here in a few weeks in the morning. All of you, Peter says, clothe yourself with humility. There's something to chew on for the week. We've been talking about the importance of that, right? Just having a little portion of Scripture in your head that you're just kind of thinking about and praying about as you go through your other activities. What does that mean? To clothe yourself with humility. Why did Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit there, put it in those words? Why did he use that sort of metaphor to describe how it is that you're to live humble? I'll just leave that for you to think about in this coming week. How does that work, to clothe yourself with humility? Because here's what we're really focusing on this passage for tonight. is because God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Again, I'm always looking for these verses like this. This morning we we noticed those four words accurately describe what the Bible is all about. The Lord is near. If you want to know what the Bible is about, it's about that. The Lord is near. And there's a lot of other details that go along with that. Here's another really simple way to describe what the Bible is about. God opposes the proud. He shows favor to the humble. And then you can elaborate a little bit on that. Well, it's our inclination to be proud, isn't it? To want to do things our way, to want to do things according to our plan, uh, to not give God all the glory that he deserves, to to take that glory onto ourselves. Uh, And all of the Bible is about turning that around, showing that God holds his hand out to those who are proud, but yet shows favor to those who are humble. Well, how is it that you humble yourself? You humble yourself by trusting in Christ. That's what we're going to see here in just a moment. So give all the glory to God, humble yourself before him, and then acknowledge yourself to be what you actually are. Okay? Acknowledge yourself to be what you actually are. This is the trap that we're so prone to fall into as people who have been Christians for a long time. We forget what happened to to bring us into this state of shalom that we so often live in where things are so good. Well, yeah, you know, it's because I did this and I did that and, and I didn't do this and I didn't do that that I have the life of shalom here that so many people don't have. No, acknowledge yourself to be what you are. Don't take credit yourself for the blessings, for the blessedness really that you live in. Titus, or Paul's letter to Titus reminds us of this. 
But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. This is something that we need to remind ourselves of often, right? It's not because of what we have done. It's because of his mercy that we have the blessing that we do. We acknowledge ourselves to be what we are, to not take credit for ourselves, and then to depend only upon the obedience of Jesus Christ crucified. I was reminded of this this past week, and I think we're going to see it more and more as this political season gets more and more interesting. Right? I was watching bits and pieces of the Republican convention the other night. And there was a fella on there. He, I don't know who he was. He had a, I liked his blue sport coat. That's one of the things I noticed about him. But he was a preacher of some sort. And I really don't know anything about the man. He could be a very good solid preacher. He may not be. I just don't know anything about him. Uh, but he talked about in his speech at the Republican convention about how Jesus Christ had transformed his life. And we love to hear that sort of thing. And what an opportunity he had not just to speak to this arena full of people who were there who need to hear about Jesus, but really he's speaking to a national platform at that point because so many other people are watching it as well. And that's awesome to hear. But just keep this in mind as you hear politicians talk about God these next couple of weeks and months. Are they talking about Christ and Christ crucified? Are they talking about the biggest need that people have, and that's to be forgiven of their sin? You see, so often the national or the public talk about God and and Jesus is how he transforms our lives and makes everything better, how if we live his way, uh, this country will be better than what it is if we don't live his way. And those things, of course, are true, but our focus is on Christ and Christ crucified. Our focus is on realizing that we were sinners and set apart from God, that shalom was not even possible for us in any sense of the word apart from God, uh, and we've been revived by the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of language that needs to define us as a church. Not just that we believe in God or that we believe in Jesus, but we believe in Jesus Christ crucified for our sin, who paid for our sin so that we could have peace with God. That's Christianity. The rest of it is just something else. Now again, I don't want to disparage that man who was speaking on TV. I don't know anything about him. He may be a very good preacher who points people to Christ crucified. Now he didn't in that particular speech. He just said that Jesus transformed his life. That can mean a thousand different things. I don't know what that means. So let's be clear about what that means for us. We're here because Jesus Christ was crucified. Not only that, but was, uh, that, that he rose by God's power from the dead, having defeated sin, having it made possible now for us to have a funeral this week that's not just going to be mourning the loss of somebody that we love, but celebrating the fact that she's singing around that sea of crystal. Huge difference between those two things. This is what Peter was so excited about as he preached here in Acts chapter 4. He said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. Believing in Christ to have your sins forgiven is not just a nice optional add-on to add to your faith. This is a command that comes to you that if you're not saved, You're going to hell. There's no other way to put it. You must be saved. You must jump off the ship before it goes under the water and it's about to go under the water. You have to be saved. You can hear the desperation here in Peter's voice as he preaches this. This is what we need to be reminded. This is why we need to be so excited about Jesus Christ crucified. Not just Jesus Christ who make my life better than what it was before. That's good. This, though, is what we're called to. We'll finish out here with, there's just no other better way I could put it than the way the confession put it. Everything that we've talked about here is enough to cover our sins and to make us confident. Remember, we've been talking about anxiety a lot on these, on these morning services, haven't we? Uh, confidence is the opposite of anxiety. 
So if you want to live this life of confidence and not be racked by anxiety the way that so many people are, you need to understand the forgiveness of sins. That's what's going to make you confident. That's what's going to free your conscience from the fear, dread, and terror of God's approach. Because again, that's our default condition, isn't it? That's the first thing that Adam, our first father, did as he trembled and tried to cover himself with fig leaves. You want to talk about anxiety, there's where our anxiety comes from, isn't it? So, the key to your blessedness, and, and, and understand that word to be much more than what we often convey it to be, blessedness. No, this is the key to living. This is the key to shalom. This is the key to prosperity, even, if you will. The key to happiness. Those are not unbiblical words. The key to all of those things is the forgiveness of your sins. It has to start there. And that forgiveness of sins makes you right with God because God grants you Christ's righteousness apart from the things that you've tried to do to make it better. And this justification comes freely by grace. Now to enjoy what you've been given, this blessedness, well, live a life soli deo gloria, to glory to God alone. Humble yourself before him. Acknowledge yourself to be what you are. Don't take the credit. And depend only upon the obedience of Jesus Christ crucified. Let's thank God for his word to us here tonight. Father in heaven, man, what a joy it is to know that you saved us to be blessed, to be happy. To, 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 to have things be the way that they're supposed to be. You did this for us, Father. That's true, but yet you did it for yourself. You did it to protect your holy name as you told your prophet Ezekiel. Because that's who we are, is your people. We bear your name. Thank you for that, Father, for giving us that blessing. Help us to live in accordance with it. Help that to be humbling to us, uh, to, to want to point others towards you because they see your name in us, to not profane your name among the nations the way that we often do. Father, we thank you for reviving us, as you said through Isaiah, giving us new life. All of these things that you have done for us on our behalf, Father, help us to enjoy these blessings too that you've given to us. Father, it's going to be a big and a busy week here at church going to be a big and busy week for the Vanderkoy family as they celebrate a hundredth birthday. Father, be with us in this coming week, especially with these two women, these two godly women who have come to the near the end of their life for Gert and at the end of her life for Anita. Father, help us to see how they lived in blessedness because they relied completely and totally on your son, Jesus Christ, they knew the forgiveness of their sins and that's what's given them the prosperity that they've been able to enjoy and pass on to us. We thank you for that. All this we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the only way that we can respond to passages like this is a song like this, not what my hands have done. We'll sing two verses of it. We're gonna pause to hear God's blessing in our life and then we'll sing the third for our doxology.
as we begin a new week, our blessing from God comes from the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25. People of God, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious present without fault and with great joy. Now to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.